Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, I'm Deborah Davidson, director and founder of Catalyst Conversations, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to a live Catalyst Conversation. We've been, we were founded in 2012 to open a critical path for dialogue between the arts and sciences. We present intimate and provocative conversations, like the one you're going to see this evening, between artists, scientists, and the public. We're interested in connecting the two through programs, educational outreach, and public events like this, which demonstrate the important conversation and synergy between art, science, and technology. I want to thank the List Visual Arts Center, uh, in particular Paul Ha, the director, and Emily Garner, um, our um, colleague who works at the List. Um, and as usual, they worked with us uh, to create this evening program. I also want to note this is our first program with a guest curator slash moderator, uh, Alberta Chu. And I look forward to hearing about art science and activism, what science can learn from artists with Dan Borelli, artist, activist, curator, and Marco, Marco Kaltovin, engineer, nuclear scientist, and activist. Dan Borelli's practice intersects identity, ecology, and the public. He says, I am fascinated by the duplicity of identity formation and how artifice is used to sustain structural forms of power. We are beginning to see instances of these power structures unraveling by various movements for more inclusivity on issues surrounding race, economics, identity, and gender equality, to name a few. Marco Keltovin, fingerprints, nuclear, chemical, and petroleum contamination via field sampling and investigations in the United States and internationally. He gets called to hotspots like the Fukushima nuclear meltdown in Japan and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm sure we all remember those. Uh, he's analyzed air, water, and sediment samples, samples for Kuwait after the Gulf War and probed for mild dehydrate issues in FEMA emergency housing after Hurricane Katrina. Together, they are Unfriending the Atom, a citizen science project which traces and maps radioactivity around the world. And so with that, um, I leave it over to Alberta and company. Welcome. Um, first off, thank you, Alberta Chu, for conceiving of this talk to invite myself and Marco uh, to share our practices in this new collaboration that we're about to embark on. And thank you, Deborah Davidson and the Catalyst Conversation Project, as well as uh, MIT List for hosting us. For me, this is my first public event live and in person since March of 2020. And so I also want to thank all of you who came out. It, we, you know, as practitioners, greatly miss being in community with people. Um, so as Deborah said, I'm Dan Borelli. I'm an artist, activist, and curator. I'm also the director of exhibitions at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. As an artist, I color contamination. And I'm doing that to help concerned communities uh, advocate for a cleaner future. I'm coloring, which sounds childish, like doodling, but I'm doing it because a lot of our toxic contamination resides outside of our ability to perceive with our human sensory apparatus. So how can we see something that we can't sense and why does this matter? And how did I come to care about this? So in this talk, I'm gonna walk you across three sites in Massachusetts that I've been working on, beginning with my hometown of Ashland, Massachusetts. This is the official town flag designed by our state senator, Karen Spilka. In the upper left is a town hall architecture, uh, kind of symbolizing good governance. The upper right is uh, nature. And the bottom is the electric clock, the uh, invention that Henry Warren uh, brought to Ashland. And we are now called, the Ashland um, team is called the clockers, right? And the laurel wreath on the bottom indicates that um, 
the Boston Marathon began there. But I'm from Ashland. So what I just showed you is what is seen, or what is publicly communicated as an identity. This is what it feels like to be from within Ashland. So on the right are my two friends, David Ketty and Kevin Kane. They both died of angiosarcomas that were attributed to the Nyanza Superfund site. And the results and the findings are on the left from uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Kevin on the right, from diagnosis to death, was 11 months. He was the youngest of nine kids. And uh, his, his mom uh, played a very significant role in the public health study as her role was our, our high school nurse. So she actually kept all the records on every single kid for three decades that went through the Ashland Public School Systems. They teach about Marie Kane and the importance of engaging with community in the Intro to Environmental Epidemiology courses. Um, so what was the source of our cancers in Ashland? Why did we become one of the first 10 sites in the Superfunds program in 1980? From color. What you're looking at is the ads from one of the first dye manufacturing plants in the United States, the Nyanza colorant plant. Um, and what I find really interesting on this vintage ad on the left is what you're looking at is all of the profit offices in the urban centers. And then on the lower right, you're seeing a lithograph of the manufacturing in the rural. So that's Ashland. Uh, that's the manufacturing in Ashland in its heyday. So one of my first gestures was to go to the site and safely sample the soil and mail it back to Chicago, one of the profit centers. I call this a dirt remittance. I'm trying to bring back the dirty dirt back to its urban center. The worst part about this whole gesture is I put the dirty dirt in a suitcase, a, a, a clear briefcase as I'm walking around Chicago. The address is gone. Everybody's gone. The responsible parties are gone. And it is an act of failure. I didn't change that narrative. So part of what I'm doing in Ashland is making this discourse public. And what you're looking at here is an exhibition in the Ashland Public Library. I'm mean, using a variety of techniques, uh, historical maps, um, topographical models. And what I showed was the water, to, to represent water, I put a mirror to show how uh, in Ashland, the generation above me, when I did my field work, would tell me about color atmospheric events. They would talk about pink snow and green rain and purple rivers, this Willy Wonka landscape. This is, an, this is a landscape of pre-regulation. And what I also wanted to show that what you're looking at is the Sudbury River itself, one of Thoreau's rivers that he canoes and says, geez, this is quite beautiful. Maybe we should talk about saving this. It's polluted from Ashland all the way up to Concord. I made a digital interface that mapped, that took all of the aggregate color-coded, amazingly, the EPA color-coding, the toxicity to show the concentration of that toxicity below the town. So there's a contaminated groundwater plume. What I discovered in talking with people is they didn't know where this contamination is today. And now, these are my people. I'm talking to them. And I start to realize I need to tell them what they need to know, not what they want to know. They want to hear that everything is fine. And now, suddenly, with consciousness comes responsibility. I start to feel like I need to show them. I need to make that data experiential, right? And as much as social movements can begin on digital platforms, this stuff was on a website, on the government's website. I made a website. The discourse didn't change. The discourse changed when I decided to aggregate 
the EPA's color value, map it to the nearest street light, apply a gel to it, and I lit the town up with the color. This is not Photoshop. I went up in a bucket truck with the Department of Public Works workers, and we accurately put the color gels up. This is what changed the narrative in Ashland, this gesture. From it came an activist group that I became a part of. We pushed against a developer who owned 200 acres of the dirty dirt, who was proposing low-income housing, and where the insiders would know they would never put their own children. So the gesture, remember the town hall symbol? This is the backside of the town hall. The town hall isn't polluted. Remember the flowing water? This is Water Street in Ashland. This place is dirty. And what was amazing was it provoked the um, EPA to do another round of science. They came in January of 2020, and uh, I was honored that Kevin Kane's parents asked me to take them to the event. And the EPA stood in front of the people of Ashland and said, due to uh, your request for more field science, we can now effectively say that you'll be polluted for 700 more years. My second site is New Bedford, Massachusetts. And many people know it as the center of whaling. Um, it's where uh, Moby Dick is written. Uh, it, it takes place, uh, when you go to New Bedford, you see a lot of, a lot of symbols of whaling. You see a lot of whale fins. Um, Melville this, Melville that. Uh, it's also the history, it's actually the beginning of exterior street illumination due to the whaling oil, which is really fascinating. But there's a deep problematics I find within um, Melville, and I'll quote chapter 42, the whiteness of the whale, um, third paragraph, as he's ruminating on the symbolism of white across plants, across minerals, across uh, fashion and culture, he then says, and I quote, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe. It's at this point I begin to reflect on my own whiteness and creating a glossary of terms by expanding this out to the whiteness of the power cultures that are producing contaminated landscapes such as New Bedford. So this is the harbor. This is, the, again, an official EPA document. The whole inner zone is one of the largest polluted natural waterways in North America. And all the way out, that purple zone is a, a, a no fish zone. And I have a public art proposal where I'd light up the no fish zone. When you go to these contaminated sites, you do see people gathering, fishing. It's very disturbing to see. Um, and I do this exercise with these communities called ground truthing, and we can talk more about ground truthing. Um, but you'll see here the official logo of New Bedford is Lucem Defundo, which is Latin for I diffuse light or I spread light. Um, this is, whaling oil was the first global energy economy, one that um, in, their, in their kind of, again, the, the sort of public image of New Bedford, um, you don't hear them talking about how destructive that force was, that economy, about the slavery conditions that were taking place on the boats and the ways in which they were consolidating profit as well as uh, bringing whales to near extinction. So again, the, that narrative is not inscribed in the built environment. So as a, a artist in residence with the National Park Service, I started to map, once again, uh, the streetlights. These historical streetlights are found, and they identify a certain zone of history. And I'm, again, proposing to shift the hue. Which brings me to my new fascination, ongoing fascination, of Plymouth, Massachusetts. America's hometown is the official motto. But there's, again, another unofficial network happening as you move down from the Plymouth Rock 
to the Plymouth Plantation about a mile down the road, if you continue, you'll hit the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant, one of the first power plants in the United States, recently decommissioned. And I'm looking at these as architectural actors. And one of the things that I did was I made an exact replica of the Plymouth Rock and whitewashed it. And I made it as a decoy, and I removed it from its architectural apparatus. I applied wheels to it and a chain, and I dragged it through the city of Plymouth as a gesture of, well, I think it's kind of obvious. Um, and at a public talk, I talked about how I see a direct connection between the cultural construct, and in Melville, he uses the word dominion, how white man has dominion over nature, and how destructive that concept is. And uh, if you just map forward in time, that just so you know, the 1620 inscription on the rock was actually put there in the 1880s, is also when the monument itself was erected. And I, I think we know what was happening in this country during that era of monument making. But if you move forward, it was 400 years in time. They were celebrating 400, the 400 years in Plymouth. Um, I was not, in, although I kept trying, I was, not, I was officially not invited to any of the festivities, but uh, to that public event called Under the Rock. So it was this group of people who were pushing against that narrative. And then if I apply Plymouth to it, you end up with a year of 12,020, when Plymouth might be clean again. So as I'm pulling data from the EPA to learn and communicate and interpret it and make experiences as an artist in Ashland and New Bedford, can't quite seem to find that same set of data in Plymouth. And that's when I meet this scientist here, Marco Kaltofen, and we start to uh, have a conversation. And I realize that he has a collection of artifacts from decades of field science that show the presence of radionuclides in everyday objects. I think this is a good moment for me to now introduce or, or turn it over to Marco. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Deborah and Alberta, and especially to the List Center for having us here tonight. Uh, one of the things that I've always found interesting about science is that the, the data alone is not necessarily bringing us to the place that we want to be. I think we've understood the basics of climate change, how the use of fossil fuels impacts our climate negatively for over 100 years. We've had that data, and it hasn't worked out well for us in terms of policy. So I find myself as a scientist having gravitated to a very specific model of doing environmental science, in, in particular, uh, extracting exotic data uh, from very mundane objects. You know, one, because these objects are a stand-in for ourselves in life. And there's a tremendous amount of data. And I'm going to get very nerdy in my short 10 minutes I've been given here and talk about the kind of data we can extract from a mundane object. And also, I and many people find those kinds of objects, a shoe, for example, really easy to relate to and understand. And importantly, when I'm talking about how this model of, of scientific investigation goes on, uh, I really need to speak out about what's very different about it, that the, the work that we do in these investigations is, is crowdsourced. It is using volunteer citizen scientists who are local and indigenous to their own communities to do the field work uh, that is giving us this really interesting and important peer-reviewed published data that we're getting on our radioactive environment. And in this case, I think everyone is, is generally familiar with how after the Fukushima uh, meltdowns, there was a real paucity of information that people could actually use for decision making. 
And that's why uh, we tried something very simple, as we asked people to uh, send us their kids' shoes. Uh, from wherever they were in different parts of Japan, we started to get packages of shoes. And we would test them in the laboratory. We would actually extract the, the individual radioactive microscopic dust particles uh, from each of these shoes. And you know, the, the thing that I learned as a scientist about these and in, in relating to these objects is that the most radioactive part of a, of a toddler's shoe from Fukushima Prefecture in Japan in 2011 uh, was the laces. And this is the part that people actually handle the most. So mom or dad is tying their kid's shoe, or the kid is learning how to tie their own shoe. And that's where people are, are, are actually picking up that radioactive dose. And so it's, it's doing a couple things for us. You know, it's collecting data that we're using that we can make decisions about. But it's also a way that people communicate back to the communities that they're a part of. So these field sampling projects that take advantage of citizen science and of these artifacts, the real product that these investigations are producing is not just the data, but it is the connected community leaders who had been part of this from the beginning, who in addition to taking samples from their communities and bringing them to us, are also taking the scientific data that we are collecting and producing and then bringing it back to their communities and interpreting for them. And I'll be honest, uh, we can all look at tables of statistics, but there's something about knowing that a, a small child's shoe is a source of radioactive exposure that fixates us in the physical reality of what's happening and how people, how people are exposed to these kinds of materials. And I would point out that uh, this technique of looking at microscopic materials that are in these mundane objects, whether it's shoes, boots, clothes, uh, bedding, uh, the list is, is endless. Uh, some of our most recent samples that we're working to acquire are the air filters from disabled Russian tanks that were involved in warfare in the Balkans recently. And using those to actually measure the radioactive dose that was experienced due to warfare around nuclear waste sites and nuclear power plants. And with Fukushima, uh, people have air filters in their cars. Uh, in Seattle, in the US, uh, during the Fukushima event, when people wondered whether they were being exposed, they had cars that were filtering the air and collecting these radioactive microparticles. And it let us map everything that was happening and again gave people a real physical feel for how they're actually being exposed, how this data is important for them as individuals. Um, and in this example, whatever happened to the waste from the Manhattan Project? As Dan pointed out at Plymouth, uh, we have at least 10,000 years to wait while radioactive materials decay to a safer level. Uh, what happened to the waste from the Manhattan Project when people were a little bit newer to radiation than they are now and regulations were even more slack than they are today? And unfortunately, uh, the way we were able to map it was to collect vacuum cleaners from people's homes uh, around the, the St. Louis area. That work on the Manhattan Project was done in St. Louis, arguably because it's too deep in the interior of the United States to be attacked by people from Germany or from Japan. So it was a strategic decision. But it means that uh, St. Louis now has this radioactive burden um, from the waste from the Manhattan Project that we're able to map on a house site by house site basis by collecting vacuum cleaners, collecting the dust, and actually physically taking out from that dust these individual microscopic objects uh, that carry the radioactivity into people's homes, and likewise can carry that radioactivity into people's bodies by inhalation or by ingestion or even by dermal contact 
I think because of COVID, we've all learned we do a lot of hand-to-mouth activity, much more than we'd really like to admit to. But this is a source of exposure to people. So what does this look like? Uh, this is an object that is eight microns, eight millionths of a meter across. Uh, this is a uh, condensed metallic ball of rare earths, um, thorium, and iron. And this came from an individual uh, who was a custodian at a nuclear weapons facility at Hanford, Washington, where America made the plutonium that went into our um, Nagasaki nuclear weapon, and many others since then. And Hanford was a major facility for producing nuclear weapons. Now Hanford's only job is cleaning up Hanford. Um, a job that is thought to take maybe 50 times the budget it took to produce the weapons that were made there. And this particular item came from the vacuum cleaner bag of this custodian's home. And we're able to exactly match this material because we can isolate it, take its picture, hold it out on a, a microscope slide, and compare it to different things that we find at Hanford. And so we can see exactly what classified weapon this custodian was working around. And, and sadly, you know, in my time with this family, um, I also uh, worked with this person's partner who was um, uh, dying of a radiation-related cancer. And after she passed, we actually were gifted the cremated remains from this person's family. And we isolated additional radioactive materials and matched them to the work that was being done at Hanford. It, it, it's, a, it's a difficult idea, but it, it shows the power of, of these nanoscale, microscale methodologies that allow us to extract data from uh, simple objects and transport these easily. Uh, if you think about it, the past two years, science has been a little stress tested. You know, that model of the, the elite high-end scientist flying out around the world, parachuting into a location, extracting data from a community, and not giving anything back except if you pay the $50, you can read the article online. That model failed during COVID because travel was difficult. But during COVID, when people were locked down, our group was still able to continue and publish and get this work done because of these relationships with individuals and with community members and make sure that that data was going back the other way. Uh, one of the places where people sometimes don't expect radioactivity is in fossil fuel extraction. Uh, this is a, a hard hat from an individual who is a brine truck driver. Does anybody know what a brine truck driver is? So what happens when you frack for petroleum is you pull brine from underneath the earth up to the surface. That brine often contains relatively high levels of naturally occurring radium, uranium, thorium, and, and other materials. And it is lawful because there is, a, there is an exemption to our radioactive waste laws for the fossil fuel industry. I can't imagine how this came about. And they actually resell the brine that contains these isotopes, and they use it for things like dust control on public roads. But the brine contains a, a good deal of radioactivity. And again, we do this in exactly the same fashion. So these microscale techniques that tell you a little bit about um, what kind of nuclear weapon you might have worked with, what is the area that a meltdown from a nuclear power plant encompassed with radioactive contamination, and what are we extracting from deep under the earth when we are exploiting fossil fuels and then spreading into the biosphere? It is all the same technique. And it lets us take these mundane objects and do a, a little bit of, of interesting science here. So some of my students at Worcester Polytech um, examined protective clothing from high school students on break in Japan who were um, volunteering to clean up radioactive materials. So a couple of uh, my students uh, went through all this clothing and tried to map out 
where the radioactive dose is highest. Is it in people's gloves, jackets, shirts, shoes? Um, if we look over here, the darkest is uh, the hands. So it was actually the gloves of these workers. And, and this was important information because it may be that having young people as volunteers cleaning up radioactive material wasn't the best way to do things. And the last little detail is, um, is this particular slide. It's one of my favorites. This is a, a sample um, from a vacuum cleaner bag recovered, again, from the, the Hanford uh, nuclear weapons plant out in Washington State. And in this particular set of dust samples, we found uh, a metallic piece of thorium. Has anyone heard of using thorium to make weapons or nuclear fuel facilities? It, it's frustrating as an environmental nuclear scientist to see old ideas recycled and marketed as a, as a brand new idea. Um, back in the 1950s, the United States tried to, dis, uh, to determine if we could make uh, nuclear weapons out of thorium, in case we ran out of uranium. And this is a 98% thorium metal splinter that we found in a vacuum cleaner bag um, outside of a radiation-controlled area. Essentially, it's a, it's a little piece of, a, uh, of a, what was going to become a nuclear weapon that we can see using this technique. And one of the, the really powerful things about mundane objects is that we're able to take simple mundane things, clothing, boots, shoes, gloves, from people who don't even work at one of these facilities, but just visit or live nearby. So what we do with our group is we take these materials that we get from an unknown nuclear site. Let's think of any small country who's not a proliferation treaty signatory that is producing nuclear weapons. If you send us their shoes and we match them up to what we find from the, the known sites, we can get a one-to-one -one match and determine with a budget of hundreds of dollars exactly what kind of weapon is being made at this unknown facility by comparing it to a known facility. And it was really fortuitous meeting and getting to work with Dan you know, I feel like it was a, a, a bit destined because my first site at the age of 21 was the Henry Woods Color Company. It was a pigment company in Wellesley. And my samples from that site came from local dog walkers whose dogs were walking in the woods and they would pick up the pigment on their paws. I got a lot of trouble at my work where I was like a brand new scientific assistant. And I completely overscaled the equipment by unknowingly putting almost pure lead chromate into their sensitive environmental equipment. Beautiful colors, incredibly toxic. And what we really expect from our project, Unfriending the Atom, is since our success rate with just taking pure scientific data and turning that into better policy is, frankly, poor by looking at mundane objects, things that people relate to, close personal items, they become not just the source of our data, but they're the instrument we use to take that information, return it to the communities that gave it to us, and help them to better understand what kinds of contamination are important to them in their personal lives. This is the artifact. This is the artwork that reaches people and completes the circle of turning, let's face it, a little bit abstract scientific information and turns it back into something that is relatable, that can reach people. And I have the great hope that that means better policy. Thank you. I'm Alberta Chu. I'm a cultural producer here in Boston. Um, really glad to be here tonight and to see so many of you here. Um, 
So then we're going to open it up to questions, but first I'm going to um, just start the dialogue. Oh, should we change the slides? Right, so um, thank you both for your presentations. And start thinking of your questions, everyone. OK, so um, you both have done this amazing investigation, personal and scientific, but really just connecting, um, giving, giving science a narrative mm -hmm. so that people can understand and feel and really understand what's, what's happening. I mean, you've taken, you've taken your artwork into the environment to investigate something very personally important to you, and it also impacts all of us with policy. Um, how, how did you, can you tell, I know you met at Plymouth at a, and, and your background is in um, community organizing. So how did Way you back both, when, yes. How did you both end up um, at the place where you met? Did people introduce you with the? Absolutely. <laughs> for unfriending the atom, or did you guys come up with that project? People, including my, my wife, who's sitting in the, office, in the audience laughing, um, kept saying, why don't you give that guy Dan a call? He's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a couple of mutual uh, people kept saying the other's name to each other, right? Um, yeah, so uh, for me, it was a set of community activists, a close personal friend, and then also uh, the sort of uh, this, this guy that runs a peace abbey kept mentioning you. Um, what I appreciate about, because I've, I've interacted with scientists on the other sites, and, and um, unfortunately, my experience has been that science wants to elevate itself as being above art. And what I'm saying is that rehumanizing the data and the narratives that we tell ourselves is as important, and that the problem with contamination is not technical, it's cultural. And that, like, I got that from Kevin Kane's mom. This is, this, she, this is, she's in her 90, she still goes to town meetings, and she's fierce. And she would take a scientist from the EPA and say, and just really interrogate them. And then at the end, she would say, well, you have to understand, no one cares how much you know, until they know how much you care. So show me that you care about me. I'll start listening. And I, I, I think that caring culture, that uh, generating of empathy with a concerned community, something that artists are good at. And I think uh, scientists, this is where I think our collaboration is going to be really rich. But I find he, Marco naturally does that as a human being. He's not one of these scientists that is like uh, telling me, you told a nice story, Dan, now let me, let me impart some real knowledge. <laughs> like, you, like we feel, I appreciate that you see, see us as being on equal knowledge footings. Absolutely true. I, I started out as a community organizer for Greenpeace. I did that work for five years. I did a lot of travel work. And since then, I've done a tremendous amount of field work that requires me to connect with people and particularly the community activists. And, and would it shock people to learn that most community activists on environmental issues are women? In fact, it, it, is, it, is, it is understood that almost all of the most effective leaders at the community level doing this work are, in fact, women. And this is not something scientists get a lot of good feedback for saying. We do have seemingly intractable environmental problems. And it's not enough to just show up with the scientific data. You have to make it understandable to people. And it also has to go into a system that can actually respond to human needs based on the data that you have. And, and frankly, having done this for several decades, I don't think we're going to solve our biggest environmental issues until we deal with patriarchy. If we don't deal with how we organize ourselves and how we understand information, 
we're not going to be able to use the data that scientists are getting to us. And we'll find ourselves where I found myself. I, I chair uh, a US Army environmental board. I have for many years. It's a small board. It's a single installation in Massachusetts. And my job is to just be the timekeeper. And we have a parade of scientists that come in. And we're trying to match the questions from the community members to the scientists that come in and make sure that their data is responding to their actual needs and what they need to know. And one guy came in, and he committed what I consider the ultimate sin in a scientific community meeting. When he got questions that were too complicated and too difficult, he actually did this. He folded his arms in front of himself. He leaned back, and he said, look, I have a master's degree. I'm a scientist. You need to trust me. And, and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm chair of this committee. I get to respond to this guy. And I ended the meeting. I stopped it. I said, all right, this meeting is over. And I turned to the Department of Defense official. I said, we're going to reschedule this meeting. And you're going to bring someone back who can answer the questions. And I adjourned the meeting. And that felt so darn good. <laughs> and it's that attitude of scientist as, as kingpin that needs to go away. And that's why um, the art science collaboration. It shouldn't be Dan and Marco. It, it should be how we always do it. Yeah. And then your work in citizen science really to change the structure of how science is done by including the public in the sample collection. It's, it's really um, just kind of turning it, turning the pyramid upside down. That's a good way to look at it. Um, it's important not just for diversity, equity, inclusion reasons to bring in people who are local, indigenous, and representative of their communities. Your science is better. Your science is better. Your science is more resilient. Your science proceeds through a pandemic um, because you're not stuck to the old parachute in elite model. Mm -hmm. But you're actually doing something where there's community involvement and People asked, what's the, the most common question I get about that? How do you know that the people who are doing that volunteer science aren't being biased, that they're not cheating, that they're not faking it, so that your science reflects what they want their reality to be? As if somehow polluters industry and conventional scientists have never done this. <laughs> So, um, so Dan, um, when you lit up the streets of Ashland it, with the color, with the actual um, colors, that really, I think, and you, you got a huge response from that. That's really just a way to connect emotion. I mean, it's part of this narrative that you've you've built to help people understand this whole complicated, kind of concealed story and hidden data and all the like your your practice as an artist really is documenting your research and then really connecting with the audience. Um, how, wh what, so with, with the Streetlight Project, was that something that, um, did you consider doing it? I mean, it had to be a live in the, in the world thing. It, it would not yeah. have been a digital. Can you talk about your process of um, coming to that project? Yeah, I, I was trying to figure out because it, it's it's close to 50 streetlights. It's a it's a big area, and I was trying to figure out how to get colored light on the ground, and I was looking into renting lights. I was looking into all these different ways, and I, I should say like central to. Central to the practice is something that's just kind of it's just kind of me. As I just I'm a, I have like wanderlust, so I'll get I'll kind of like fall in love with a deeply problematic site and I'll go back I'll walk it, I'll I'll then go back another time and do the reverse of that walk. I'll I'll just keep walking it and walking it and um, that is what is called the cartographer is called ground truthing. So the first act of making a map is to draw from above 
The second act is to walk the map and verify it from your perspective from the ground. And I love this as a, as a phrase, as like an artistic methodology. The truth is on the ground. And if you can meet people there and listen, to me, the listening is very important in field work. They'll tell you, they'll share their narrative, right? Um, and it was through that moment, I'm like, how am I going to get light? And I'm walking, I'm like, well, it, it's there. It's already there. And I just started to think, like, what if our exterior illumination system could also be a smart, responsive communication system? What I did in Ashland was analog, I, I, in part because the cost of putting in programmable sensor-based LEDs, even like it, it, it can't. It's not really to market. It's a crazy idea. What I found interesting in the proposition was this juxtaposition between some people, because uh, I had to go through a series of permissions, and some people struggling with it as an idea. And I remember being at a particular community board meeting like the one you're talking about. And this one particular guy, and you're right, it's always guys who are like, Ugh, why are you doing this? You know, right? And so there was this guy who was like, so you want to light up the town? You want to light up the town on the contamination we live on top of? I go, yeah. He goes, that's absurd. I said, I know. <laughs> he goes, so why are you doing it? And I, I wasn't being, I go, I'm sorry, when you said that's absurd, and I said, I know. I was saying, it's absurd that we still live on top of contamination. That's absurd. I'm just taking the data and mapping it one to one. It's your data. It's not my data. This is your town. This is your contamination. Like, own it. And I'm, I'm, I'm done just kind of accepting that. I was given a promise when I was a young boy. By the time you kids get out of college, this place is going to be clean. And people just keep getting sick. I just I can't live with it anymore. That's absurd. Should we open it up to should, questions? Yeah. <laughs> Any questions uh, from the audience? <laughs> Oh, they, they, they yes, do uh, there's like someone with them, yeah. OK. Oh, when you ask your question, could you, um, could you tell us your name and repeat and um, affiliation? Sure. Hi. Thank you both so much. My question is really just a context question. Um, anyway, this has been a really informative and uh, powerful introduction to what you guys are doing. My name is Adria. Um, I run an art center in East Cambridge. And my question was just if you could say a little bit more about um, what unfriending the atom is. Mm. That's a Who wants to go point. first? Um, so it's a cultural critique of the, of the nuclear cultures that are out there. In the early 1950s, amidst uh, the success of the American culture in World War II, um, there was this idea to convert all of this knowledge of nuclear weapon making into energy making. But they realized they had an incredible problem because of the massive destructive force that was unleashed upon humanity. And so what did they do? They, they made it into a narrative. And they hired the best narrative person in the world at the time, Disney. Mm -hmm. And he created a project called Our Friend, The Atom. And then he, in that narrative construct, he brings forth a genie as a, as a narrative arc, right? And in that story, the atom is the genie. And it was like, well, it's out of the bottle, <laughs> right? And, and like all genie stories, it ends with three wishes. And so in Our Friend the Atom, it concludes that the atom will deliver three things, our three wishes. 
It will deliver unending, clean energy. Energy is number one, it's going to deliver. Number two, clean and equitable access to food and health. And number three, it's going to deliver peace. And so here we are, all these years later, and we're now critiquing it, going, how, did, how well is Adam delivering on those three points? And if I could pick that up, sometimes people have described me, a nuclear scientist, as anti-nuclear. And this doesn't make any sense. Um, a, a, a meteorologist is not anti-weather if they're concerned about hurricanes. They're just studying a force of nature. So the same thing is happening here. Unfriending the atom means treating nuclear power and radiation as a force of nature. Uh, one of the biggest things we hear now is that, well, we need new nuclear power plants because of climate change and a need for low carbon energy. But there's no real connection here. A nuclear power plant is a mechanism. It has no concern whether you have an ex existential need for low carbon power or not. It's a device. It works or doesn't work. So the idea of unfriending the atom is taking uh, radiation and the nuclear industry out of that emotional construct that somehow this is our friend and not just a force to be dealt with. Yeah, and like, so reestablish a human non-human relationship to it, right? When I told you about the Disney, everybody just sort of, you just sort of bought it because we're so used to anthropomorphizing elements outside of us. Like, yeah, the genie, I get that, you know? And it's gonna become our friend and it's gonna deliver all these things. And we're, has it? And we have every right to critique it culturally. Every right. And um, yeah, moving forward, what I came to understand, now this is where I put on like my exhibition making hat and uh, artist hat. This man has a, he has a collection. It's like an archive. 30 years of field science, objects from all, all over the world. I started to think of ways in which we uh, spatialize these artifacts and when you do, when you take the, the aggregate of these artifacts and you spatialize them into a room like this, you're now getting this interesting correlation between that object and this object and it starts to get into very interesting relations that we talk about as artists about, you know, other artifacts. Like let's have that same set of relations about his particles, well, they're not yours. The ones that he's finding and discovering, and you like, you know. So, and again, we're this is like a this is our first like public launch of it, right? So we're really starting off. The first thing is to catalog it, to create a language set. So what you're looking at is a set of a, a, a set of representations around one object. So you get the photograph, you get the geographic location, you get the timestamp. You get the notation of the radionuclide or radioactive particle that he's finding. And then the color coding is from the chart of nuclides. So it is a, just like in Ashland, there was a color coded system by the EPA. He introduced me to the uh, nuclear science color coded chart of radioactivity. And I was like, oh my, I can't, I'm coloring again. Now I'm coloring with radioactive shoes. Yeah. This is insane. Hi, my name is Steve Hollinger. Um, with COVID, it seems like we've seen um, an interesting response to science, maybe to me somewhat uh, surprising in terms of how people responded. I'm curious in, in your work, if you've seen similar surprising responses to making visible what was formerly invisible, things like putting color on the streets um, what was your, what was the res what was the response that you saw, and was some of it surprising? Sounds like a Dan question. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I, I kind of go one third, I can say explicitly with, when I do these as a, I, I do like public engagement mapping exercises with, with communities. And I always say it's like one third, one third, one third. One third is passionate, knows about it and cares. The other third is like, this is complete baloney. You're full of it. The other third is the one that's like, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know how I feel about it. I, have, I don't know. It's like apathy. And I think that's the group that we want to like engage with. The one third side that is openly resisting it, I find quite often they have a stake in the game. So when I started the Ashland Project, a former board of selectmen, now you got to understand, uh, at that particular time, when they, they, they put a high school next to, the, new, uh, next to the, the chemical plant, right, in the mid-60s, that was my high school. Um, and I read the town reports and the transcripts, and some people questioned it. And at the time, the town health agent was also the head of board, select, board of selectmen was also the chief engineer at the chemical plant, right? And it's a guy, it's always a guy, going, you got nothing to worry about, trust me. If something was of concern, we would let you know. And now, now, like, we feel really deeply betrayed. And it's, it's funny, because you can almost map the dissolution of trust of your kind of, like, middle-class citizen through the trajectory of that project. And we're so far the other way Nobody trusts anything anymore, and it, it. So part of part of the engagement is to reestablish a healthy discourse. If some, if I go out in a public space with a map and somebody says, "I think this is baloney," I'm like, "Let's talk about it." I don't have a pro. Let's talk about it. I'll just sit there and well, let's have a conversation. I don't. That's totally fine if you want to say that, but sit down with me. And usually they they kind of take it down a level, and we end up having a great conversation. What I found in New Bedford was like, this one person was like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, the Patriot missile used to be assembled here. And they were abutting on the river, uh, I'm sorry, on the harbor, and that was a bad, that was a bad sight too. I was like, Thank, that, uh, okay, we just, <laughs> that's a nugget to write that on the map, thank you. If I could jump back to the uh, uh, Adam is your friend, uh, I happen to have personal knowledge of the situation in, uh, in Plymouth. And when Pilgrim won, New and for those of you who aren't familiar, it's directly on the ocean. Uh, if it were a house, it'd be a, a multi, multi million dollar house. The view is outstanding. You can see all the way uh, to P-Town, to Whitehorse Beach. Uh, to Priscilla Beach and uh, to the left of Plymouth Beach. Uh, it's just an outstanding location. But uh, when it first opened, there was a uh, quarter to a half mile winding drive through this elaborately landscaped uh, uh, forest, which went to a, a very large parking area with a 10 acre park. There was a playground for children, <laughs> uh, there were picnic tables for, uh, uh, for the adults. There was a fishing dock with little holders for fishing poles, which literally went out over the uh, tunnels, which uh, fed the cooling water from, um, from the plant uh, uh, into the harbor. And they had little stands with postcards where you could, uh, with a little picture of, the, of, this, uh, uh, of this park, um, uh, where you could send to your friend saying, hey, look, <laughs> look where I had lunch today at the Pilgrim One nuclear power plant. How, how, do you, how, how do you fight something like that? And the other part of this was that at the time, the power plant paid half, literally half, of all the real estate taxes in the town of Plymouth. And it became a magnet uh, for, uh, for young homeowners because now they, they, they and there was lots of land there was suddenly a, a place where they could live. 
And unfortunately, you had uh, radioactive materials in the cow's milk in the cow's at Plymouth Plantation, which you mentioned uh, you know, earlier is a problem. So that's just a little background. I don't have a question other than uh, to give uh, Adriana uh, a little background of what, what everybody was up against back then. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to address that. And, and I think one of the things that happens is when you're looking at a, a, an impacted community versus um, a, a major installation of any kind, there is a huge power imbalance between those two sides. Because there's a lot of information control at one side. I mean, our, our project, it, when, we, when we collect these materials from people, there's one ironclad rule. Every bit of data must be public, open, public domain data, where from the first minute, this, this, this artifact and its data are available to anyone and can be shared. And if I could, if I could make a, 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 an odd example of this, uh, what's happening is now we have community members who, for very little funding, have access to very high-end nanoscale instrumentation and that their samples can come even from places where information control is part of their, their governing style, meaning we can get samples from countries that are not democracies, that are so tiny, that are so mundane, they're not obvious as samples, and they can safely be shipped and transported. And then suddenly people have access to this high-end instrumentation. And if you remember the first scene in Ghostbusters, where Bill Murray, Professor Venkman, has finally vanquished his first ghost. He says, you know what? You shouldn't have messed with somebody who has a proton accelerator on their back. And that's what's happening with these community members, is we're giving them that level of technological authority. One final point. That's the kind of story we want to learn and capture. So we'll, let's talk afterwards, because you just painted a, a, a first person perspective of the sort of euphoria and techno-optimism that surrounded that culture at that time. Uh, I, there was another question. Hi, um, I'm Diana Vosberg from Holliston. I used to live in Ashland, actually. And I remember, yeah, I remember people talking about the kids playing in what they called Chemical Creek. Yep. So it would run a different color, like day by day. And I always thought, how strange that would be to be a child, and you live in this kind of colored wonderland mm -hmm. in your environment, and you have no idea that it could give you cancer later. Yeah. And um, I'm an oil painter, and I know that the history of a lot of the pigments we use have been so toxic, a lot of them coal-tar-derived coal or lead-based or whatever. And yet, we use them to make these really beautiful images, sort of like the image I see on the screen there. And I was kind of curious about your use of aesthetics or beauty in conveying a message about toxicity. And there's sort of this strange dialectic or strange paradoxical relationship there. That's a great question. I'll, I'll answer that first, and I'll, and I'll go to the chemical brook. I always say, like, I totally believe that art can beautify and celebrate. And I think that's absolutely vital. Sometimes I get put into this false dichotomy, like I'm saying, like beauty doesn't matter, or other practices or mediums or studio-based methods don't matter. It's not what I'm saying. I started off as a painter, love painting, love drawing. Um, but I feel strongly that art can also advocate through aesthetics and engagement for people who have deep concerns and they need help against these types of power structures you're talking about. Um, it was called Chemical Brook. Today, they renamed it Trolley Brook. Uh, so in part of the kind of field work I did, I interviewed people from Ashland. I interviewed EPA. I, I interviewed Karen Spilka. Um, but my friend Timmy, uh, it was the same year as Kevin and David. And Timmy had, Timmy abutted the site on Cherry Street. And he remembers like running, running through chasing turtles. He goes, I'd come home, my mom would be mad at me because my socks were purple. 
and she was a registered nurse and never thought anything of it. And then at 13, Timmy couldn't breathe. Her nurse skills kicked in, took him in, and they found a grapefruit-sized tumor on crushing his esophagus. Um, somehow he's the only person we know of that survived. In, in his interview, it, it's really interesting. And he, he goes, I just kept remembering mom being upset because so I ruined my socks. That just tells you like the, the depth to which she, as caretaker, trusted the information that was being given to her. Great. Um, oh, well, do we have one, one last question from the audience? <clears throat> Yeah, I'm Nam from Babson College uh, Public uh, Policy and International uh, Affairs Club, and we're very interested in data analytics in public policy, which is why I uh, appreciate your works. Um, however, I imagine that from raising consciousness to actually affecting a policy, there are a lot of more steps uh, where you need some power or leverage, and so I, I wonder what, uh, how, how can we have some uh, leverage when we deal with authorities and with the systems uh, and to uh, to get our uh, um, agenda uh, through. Thanks. Oh, may I? Of course. <sighs> <clears throat> when there is an existing power structure and they have a scientific issue at hand, they have a natural advantage because we have plenty to do in our lives, and it's difficult to learn all of the science that, that is required. And so what's happening is people are counting on a lack of engagement. Mm -hmm. They're counting on apathy. And as it turns out, there are lots of places where, at least in the uh, US and in similar systems, there are lots of points where public comment, public engagement, and so on are required. And sometimes they're pro forma. But other times, you can, if you know that, 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 that sensitive spot and you push on it, you can make things happen. I'm going to give one example of one of the greatest attorneys that I know, Tom Carpenter. There was a public hearing about a new budget change for Hanford Nuclear Reservation. I mean, they have tens of thousands of employees. And Tom signed up about 40 different witnesses from the Hanford community that were mostly custodians and service personnel and laborers. And one at a time, they got up and they told their very personal story about why a particular Hanford policy was um, ruining their lives and harming their families. They cried. This went on for hours and hours. And finally, the, the, the engineers and politicians at the board said, OK, stop. No more, Tom. No more witnesses. We'll fix this. They identified the spot where the system was weak. And they engaged people who directly shared their narrative. And that worked. And that's the, that's the special sauce, engaging. Um, the opposite of apathy. And arming yourself with a little bit of knowledge and where that, that, that pressure point is um, makes a big impact on your effectiveness. Great. OK, so um, we should wrap this up. So uh, thank you both so much. I admire your work, your important work, your creativity, your research, your activism. It's really an inspiration uh, just to all citizens to really have agency and be involved. So um, we can continue this conversation uh, in the neighborhood at Area 4. Um, grab a drink and dinner after, after this. Um, but I also want to leave everyone with, I guess, art can save the world, science can save the world, and art and science together can save the world. So thank you for participating tonight. Uh, wonderful evening with Catalyst Conversations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.